Manning's equation, as you may remember, tells us that the flow rate in the channel is equal to a conversion factor K over roughness coefficient N times the area, the cross-sectional area in that channel times the hydraulic radius to the power of two thirds times the square root of the longitudinal slope. Now, I, I do wanna talk a little bit about this equation because I feel that when I explained it in the class, I kind of rushed through it and didn't really talk about the physical meaning of this equation. So let's recall a couple of things. When we did our energy equation analysis on open channels, we used the energy equation for steady uniform flow. And that should give us a bit of a hint here that when we are using Manning's equation, we are dealing with steady uniform flow. Of course, we know that in nature, most flows are not steady, not uniform, but this steady uniform assumption is pretty helpful, particularly because it gives us results that aren't too far away from realistic results. But I do want you to understand that Manning's equation is an equation for steady uniform flow. When a flow, especially a flow in an, in an open channel is steady and uniform, we usually call it normal flow. So you may hear that term a lot when you're taking your hydraulics classes or hydrology classes. The term normal flow refers to flow that is both steady and uniform. Now in class today, one of the students asked what, what happened if the cross section got reduced in a channel? And the answer is simple. Because our flow rate remains constant under steady uniform flow, if you have a reduction in cross section, that means that your depth will have to increase to accommodate all that flow rate. If your depth does not increase, then your velocity has to increase to accommodate that flow rate. So there's those two possible scenarios. If you have flow in a channel, and then for some reason the channel contracts, and this is top view, for some reason the channel contracts, one of two things can happen. Either your flow velocity has to increase so that the flow rate remains constant. Or if your flow velocity does not increase, your depth will have to increase. Now you'll see that that increase in depth is not really um, common for steady uniform flows. Typically, increases in depth downstream um, are part of a phenomenon called hydraulic jump, which sadly we're not going to have time to cover in class. But if we're dealing with steady uniform flow, then we really won't have a depth increase. We're going to have a velocity increase. Now, Manning's equation is an equation that applies for a cross section, which means that if I would like to apply Manning's equation to a flow such as this one, I would have to find or apply Manning's equation at every point where my cross section changes in order to understand fully how the flow, how the, the fluid in this channel is behaving. I can't really apply Manning's equation to an entire control volume because Manning's equation in and of itself really is a cross section or control surface equation. So I, I did wanna make sure that that's all um, clear with us. Manning's equation is for a control surface, right? For cross section, not really for a control volume. So now that we have that clear, just as a bit of a review of terms, this is a conversion factor that converts from cubic roots of meters to cubic root of feet. This is the roughness coefficient, which is this determined by the material of the channel. This is the cross-sectional area. This is the hydraulic radius, which is the ratio of area to the wet perimeter. And the wet perimeter is the linear measurement of the portion of the channel in contact with the fluid. And this is the longitudinal slope, the slope along the direction of flow. So let's just do a pretty traditional problem, which is the trapezoidal channel problem. Now, normally the way an introductory fluid mechanics class gives you this problem is by giving you the dimensions of the trapezoidal channel. Those dimensions will include the side slopes and let's say that this channel has side slopes of one vertical to four horizontal, eh, maybe two horizontal. It's pretty steep side slopes. And let's give this uh, channel a base of what? Jessica, can you recommend the base width? Um, what units are you wanting to use? Uh, just whatever you choose. Mm, three feet. No, not that. 
Let's um, give this channel a base of 10 feet. Good try, Jessica. Normally in a typical fluid mechanics problem for an introductory fluids class, they will give you this depth and ask you to calculate the flow rate. And at this point, we're just plugging numbers into Manning's equation, but you are not the typical fluid mechanics students. So instead, I will not give you the depth. I will give you the flow rate. So let's say that for this particular channel, which has a normal slope of 1%, so slope of 0 0.01, which is the same as just 1%. Let's say that for this channel, my flow rate is going to be, uh, it's actually a pretty big channel. So maybe I can give it a pretty big flow rate. I'm gonna say that my flow rate is gonna be about 1000 cubic feet per second. And my question is for this channel, which has a flow rate of 1000 cubic feet per second, a trapezoidal cross section, what is the depth of flow? So any ideas on how we can find that depth of flow? Manning's equation? Yes. Unsurprisingly, we- Solve for R, I guess. Can you say that again? Uh, solve for R and then figure out what Y is. I would say that, Ryan. My only problem is that my area of flow depends oh, on Y yeah. as well. Yeah, okay. Maybe you can solve for AR, right? So I like what both of you said, right? I, I like that we have to use Manning's equation. And I like that Ryan is already thinking in terms of how we can solve this problem. And by solving this problem, what we're going to have to solve for whatever is a function of y, which is ar to the power of two thirds. So you'll see that a very common way of solving Manning's equation, um, particularly in, in industry, involves solving for the ar to the two thirds um, term in Manning's equation. If I were to apply Manning's equation, um, let me make sure that I have all of my terms accounted for. We know that my k coefficient is a conversion factor. We're dealing with English units. So does anybody know what that conversion factor will be? Some um, 1.486. That's correct, 1.486. If we were dealing with metric units, we would use a K value of one, as you may already recall from the class. Um, let's say this is, um, let's say this is, uh, I wanna use concrete because we've always used concrete, but you already know the N value for concrete. Let me give you a different, Thing. Let's say that this is a wood channel. Now nah, that doesn't really make sense. Why would anyone have a wood channel so big? Let's say that this is a channel made of, God, I can only think of concrete. Hmm. All right, never mind. Let's say this is a concrete channel. I want to make this problem seem realistic, and I'm not going to come up with some crazy material. Really most channels you either dig into the ground so it's just earth and grass or you just pour concrete so it's concrete. You'll see the book gives you glass channels and all that so nobody makes that. Okay so if this is concrete what's the roughness coefficient for concrete? Zero point zero one three. Okay now, Lauren, I'm gonna play the role of an entry-level reviewer for a state agency. Entry-level, which means that I don't know much. State agency, which means that I get to approve your results. And I will say, um, Lauren, if I can call you that, when I looked at my textbook, the end value for concrete was actually 0 0.012. Why are you using 0 0.013? That's what I have from the packet you gave me. <laughs> oh, God. Um, I did explain in class that even though the textbook gives you 0 0.012, um, it's actually more common to use in real life 0 0.013. So you'll see that more academic sources, resources give you a 0 0.012 Manning's roughness coefficient. But in this industry, more industry oriented sources will give you a roughness coefficient of 0 0.013. And here's what happens. Um, Freshly cured, freshly finished concrete 
has been found through laboratory experiments to have a roughness coefficient of 0.012. The problem is that once you pour that concrete, once it dries and once it's ready to start conveying flow, the concrete is not going to remain as smooth as it was the day it was finished. So what happens is the pretty much the deterioration of the concrete has shown right through you know through the multiple measurements and all that stuff has shown that in reality concrete actually behaves in in the industry in the field as if it had a roughness coefficient of about 0 0.013 so if you ask anyone that knows academic stuff they will say 0 0.012 I would say that if you ask anyone that works in the field, they will say 0 0.013. Now it actually is um, better, I would say, from, from my perspective, right? It's better to use 0 0.013 because it is a little bit more conservative as well. Um, sometimes if an engineer wants to make sure that their document is approved and that the channel actually carries or the pipe conveys all the flow that you want it to convey, you may reduce it to 0 0.012. But I'm not a big fan of that practice. I think a more realistic um, treatment would be to leave this channel as 0 0.013 for its roughness coefficient. Rent over, let's move on. The area of this channel, this is a trapezoidal channel. So does anybody remember the area for a trapezoidal channel using these side slopes, the base, and of course the depth Y? What was that area? I have this written down from the lecture, but the area for the trapezoid was um, equal to the base times the depth y plus uh, the depth squared over two times slope m1 plus m2. So the slope of the first one plus, uh, plus the slope of the second one. Like this? Yes, that's how I have it written down. All right, so we know that M1 and M2 are actually gonna be the same. So we can simplify this just a little bit to 2M, 2M, I'll just call it 2M. 2M divided by two is just M, so Y squared M. And from here, we know that my base is 10 feet. My height is Y, my height is Y, and my slope, my side slope is two. So this is the area of this trapezoidal shape, at least as much as we can get, as far as we can get, the area will be 10y plus 2y squared. Now the wetted perimeter for this trapezoidal cross section was a little bit more complicated, right? I think the wetted perimeter we said was b plus and then a bunch of square roots. Can anybody remind me what those terms were so I, I don't have to calculate them again? It was y times the square root of one plus m squared plus the square root of one plus m squared. Since it's the same, it'll just be two times square root of one plus m squared. Thank you. And like you said, since they are the same, it's just gonna be two times square root of one plus m squared. Plugging in what we already know, we know the base is 10 feet. So 10 feet times two times y times one plus two squared, and that's five, right? I'm gonna write it in this way just because I like it better. So 10 plus two root five y. Good. So we have our water perimeter. Why do we have a water perimeter? Because we wanna use it to determine our hydraulic radius. The hydraulic radius, if you may have forgotten, is simply the ratio of the area to the wetted perimeter. So it's just all of this divided by all of this. I'm not even going to try to simplify that. Let's just leave it at that. And finally, the longitudinal slope is 1%, so 0 0.01. Now, following on Ryan's um, 
strategy, we want to solve for all of our unknowns. Our unknowns will be area and hydraulic radius, because you can see that they both depend on our depth y. So doing that, we can rearrange Manning's equation to solve for area times hydraulic radius, and we get that AR to the two thirds is equal to flow rate times my roughness coefficient divided by K times the square root of the slope. This is actually a very common form of the equation. You may see it like that in some literature. We know the flow rate, which is 1,000 cubic feet per second. We know our roughness coefficient, which is 0 0.013. We know that the conversion factor is 1.486. And we know that the slope is 0 0.01. This gives us an area times hydraulic radius to the two thirds of 1,000 times 0 0.013 divided by 1.486 and then divided by the square root of 0 0.01. So 87.5. And you can figure out the units yourself. I guess it would be uh, feet to the Five, no, feet to the eight thirds, I think. 87.5 feet to the eight thirds. But you may want to confirm that. I don't want to write it down and then end up looking like a dumbass or something, okay? So we have the area times the hydraulic radius to two thirds. However, that doesn't really help us because in the end, we want to find this depth Y. So then what can we do to find this depth Y? I'm going to rewrite what we have here. We have area times hydraulic radius to the two thirds equals 87.5. We know that the area was 10y plus 2y squared. We know that the hydraulic radius is the ratio of the area to the wetted perimeter. So this will be 10y plus 2y squared divided by 10 plus 2 root 5. Oh, I forgot my 2. Y and all this elevated to the power of two thirds. Um, these two are the same, so I'm just gonna combine them to make my life a little bit easier. 10y plus two y squared. Uh, this will be five thirds. Over 10 plus two root five y. And now we have one equation one unknown. How do we solve for that unknown? You're not going to like it. We're going to have to solve numerically. Unless one of you is brave enough to try to solve for y here analytically, um, I'm not. We're going to have to solve numerically. We're going to get to um, some situations when we're in the field where we end up having to solve for numbers. And the best way is just trial and error, right? The, the most common numerical way of solving a problem is trial and error. Um, of course, there's already software that solves this for you numerically, but I think it would be good practice for you to learn how to solve these, right? You can do a spreadsheet in Excel. You can write some code in MATLAB or Python or whatever. In industry, nobody uses MATLAB um, because nobody wants to pay for that. So you may want to look at some free, free programs, I would say. But yeah, up to this point, all we have left is to plug in values of y that give us 87.5 here. You may think that because this is, um, you have a squared term that's going to be elevated to the power of 5 over 3, you may think that there will be multiple answers of y. But actually, um, problems like this will typically end up having only one solution, which is actually makes our lives a little bit easier. Right, because normally when you're dealing with squared terms or polynomials, you have multiple solutions. In this case, we may end up just um, problems like this end up just giving us one solution. So I'll let you try to figure that one out. Um, we're about three minutes away from ending this review session, and I don't want to solve this, so you can solve it yourselves. Um, let me stop recording here. <laughs>